Hey everyone, welcome to Love, Rinse, Repeat, a podcast recorded on Gay Omago land by me, Liam Miller. He, him, his, a minister in the Uniting Church in Australia. I am very excited today. My guest is Hannah Bacon. Hannah, welcome along. Hi, hi. Nice to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Oh no, it's exciting to, exciting to have you and get to talk to you. So for those who don't know, Hannah is the Professor of Feminist Theology at the University of Chester over in the UK. Uh, and she is the author of this book we're discussing today, Feminist Theology and Contemporary Dieting Culture, Sin, Salvation and Women's Weight Loss Narratives, which is out through TNT Clark, you can get it in paperback, uh, and you're going to see why you should get it in paperback through our conversation today. So I guess, Hannah, just, just, just starting off, I guess, like, where did the idea for this project emerge from? Um, you know, what got you decided, like, yeah, this is exactly what I want to devote a bunch of time uh, to in the next little while. And, uh, and yeah, how have you maybe found its, um, its reception uh, so far? Yeah, so I think kind of what got me interested in, so before I started work on this book, I should say, I, I'd been working quite a lot on more systematic theology if we if we might call it that and I'd done some work on the trinity and I really enjoyed doing that kind of work but more and more mm. in my academic career I was getting kind of irritated to a certain extent by the kind of abstractness of that kind of doing theology um, and this need to kind of try and do something which is a bit more embodied you know I'm a feminist mm. theologian I've got particular feminist sensibilities which I can't help but kind of bring to my scholarship so I started kind of after I'd done the work on the Trinity looking elsewhere and my interests really were really about kind of embodiment and body theology and I'd always been personally interested in kind of weight loss you know I come from a family like many of us probably do where weight is one of those things that gets talked about and Mm -hmm, you know you mm -hmm. understand your own body in relation to how others see it and you know I was always kind of like the biggest out of all three of all three of the kids that my you know within our family so and I've always kind of been very conscious of that I guess um so bringing that kind of family dimension I suppose forward and and being a Christian I was really interested as well in the relationship between weight and Christianity and knew about this kind of big movement that was going on in the states where Christians were sometimes bringing together their Christian faith with with weight loss dieting and Mm. I was fascinated by that you know so my interests kind of started off both personal and academic in terms of you know my own personal family background but academic in terms of Christian dieting that's where Mm. I started off Uh, but that gradually took me towards kind of secular commercial weight loss dieting which is what the book's about obviously so it was a gradual kind of step by step uh, Mm. kind of you know journey I suppose yeah so it's interesting so you mentioned obviously there like weight is something just discussed around you know in most households Um, some better some worse in the way they approach it as, and then, yeah. of course, there's these huge industries, right? Like of, of weight loss books, of fitness books, podcasts, um, yeah. as well as yeah. you know things on every new year. It's this is the how you meant to eat now, what you're not yeah. meant to eat. Now. You know, so it's this it's this huge industry. It's just like the culture is bathed in it for better and worse. Um, yeah. And yeah, like and I could be missing a bunch of stuff, but I, I think if I I'm, think I'm reasonably abreast of a, like a lot of what is written in theological circles, and like I know your book. And I know Lisa Isherwood's work on the fat Jesus, um, and maybe there's a few others I could point to, but it still feels like, you know, woefully under, under considered um, yeah. by Christian theologians, like, and the gamut of it, right? Weight loss, yeah. food, um, you know, the, the whole thing. And I, I guess, you know, in, in researching your book and then in talking to people through the process and in the afterwards, um, first of all, I guess, Am I right in thinking there's not much out there? Uh, and why, if that is the case, why do you think it is still given, you know, it's so prevalent as an issue at the forefront of many people's minds? Yeah. You think, you know, usually having something you can say is I'm doing something that's topical and relates to people's lives, usually a good thing. Um, yeah. And yet this seems, you know, a no brainer and yet not being engaged. Yeah, the interesting thing, I mean, you are right. There's not been very much um, produced within the academic kind of community of theologians on this area mm-hmm. and there's very kind of multiple reasons for that which I'll kind of like maybe give my view on in, in a minute but interestingly actually for me there's not been very much written in feminist theology on mm. um dieting and, and weight loss um, and that's even more kind of uh surprising we might say I mean yeah. I actually yeah. want to say alarming or you know worrying <laughs> uh, but it is also you know surprising so there's there are questions to ask obviously about what why that is mm. my hunch which I start to kind of like 
write about in the book towards the beginning of the book a little bit is is that we're still operating with ideas about what constitutes good theology or bad theology or proper theology or not proper theology <laughs> improper theology and proper theology is kind of engaging with kind of christian doctrinal kind of ideas about you know christology or about sin or about you know trinity or about whatever mm -hmm. it might be and and really pulling apart those kind of theological areas of, of doctrine um and something which is a bit more focused on bodies and on kind of weight and size and fat and thin seems too trivial for theologians to kind of concern themselves with and with my feminist um kind of lens applied to that I start to be a bit suspicious of what's going on there because they're trivial because they're linked with women and they're trivial because they're linked with women's bodies and embodiment. So there's a there's a deeply misogynist background operating, I think, there, you know, which is very, very alarming. Um, so there's something about proper theology and there's something also related to that, I think, about the trivialization of women's bodies and this idea that, you know, weight loss is something that belongs in a magazine or on some popular TV programme where you kind of talk about what your New Year's goals are, like you've just kind of alluded to. Um, and that's as good as it is. And that's as far as we should take it. And theologians should rise above that and do something which is a bit more kind of um, uh, meaningful. Yeah, so I, don't, I don't. I don't agree that that's the case. Clearly, no. <laughs> I've written a whole book about it. But. Yeah, it's almost like you know, like yes, the the, the people peddling these ideas are it's so silly and so easily dismissed with a with a, a modicum of thought. So we don't need to give it more than a modicum, and 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 thus you don't actually engage it. But I think, well, I guess what your book shows is, you know, how pervasive and um, that this actually needs to be tackled with a, a, a level of rigor and not just seen yeah. as like oh it's it's so trivial and fluffy that we don't even have to actually yeah address it. absolutely and and kind of on top of that i think you know what what i'm trying to say in the book as well is that they are theological issues you know weight and size and fat and food obviously are deeply theological issues because they they concern kind of the very heart of our existence who we are our value our dignity our worth you know, and if we take seriously the kind of theological idea that God has created us all in God's image and that that matters and that how we live and what our bodies do actually is all about, you know, the glory of God and worship and things like that, then actually, you know, how we treat our bodies and how our bodies are treated um, by others actually becomes a theological, you know, uh, point of not just interest, but significance. It's really, really important stuff. Um, and I think we've, grab, we've grasped that a little bit with food because now we're becoming, you know, in the West especially, more and more aware of where our food comes from and more concerned from a Christian point of view about where our food comes from. But, you know, we're not, we've still not kind of grasped that, you know, there are other kind of tentacles reaching out from that which impact, you know, bodies and size and weight, which we yeah. also need to be concerned about. And it's not trivial. It's harming women's bodies and men's bodies and it's causing a great deal of um dis-ease among different communities and we need to take that seriously yeah absolutely i think that's so important so yeah. um, i mentioned that the subtitle before sin salvation and women's weight loss narrative so, th so the book is very much you know organized around these kind of doctrinal loci of, of sin yeah. and salvation and how they kind of play out um yeah, how they kind of play out in these and, and surface and resurface in contemporary uh, weight loss narratives. So maybe just starting with, talk to us a bit about, you know, that observation of, of, of and, and maybe yeah. you know, the examples that come to mind of how this is kind of in that. Um, yeah. And I guess why that was so then, how that then, you know, led you to be like, this is how I'm going to tackle it. I, you know, it has to yeah, be yeah, yeah. salvation. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's probably worth saying that the book is based on field work. So it's not a kind of just a it's not just a kind of theoretical study of weight. It's based on um, some ethnographic work that I did over an extended period of, of about 13 or 14 months mm. uh, in a in a secular commercial weight loss group um, in in the UK where I spoke to uh, the mainly uh, majority women uh, group members about how they were experiencing uh, dieting and weight loss and the organization and all of that and also you know um, uh, attended as a as a participant as well so I actually joined the group and attended along with the other members for that period of time and did lots of participant observation and all of that so 
that's the kind of data set that I was using to inform this kind of study. And what was fascinating about the particular organisation that I joined and observed and the women that I spoke to, it was that this organisation does use the terminology of sin to speak about food. So there is an overt borrowing from Christianity mm. there. Um, I call it the treasure chest of Christianity in the book because it's valuable and it, and, it, and it works well for this particular weight loss group to kind of recycle that Christian kind of um, idea. And it is recycled within this weight loss group. So women in the group will repeat the kind of normative meanings that Christian theologians and, and, and Christians um, will give to the term sin. So, you know, sin... Is often so sin in, in, in the organization is linked with foods which are high in saturated fats and sugars. So things like all the stuff that we really enjoy eating, like crisps, chocolate, <laughs> cake, <laughs> alcohol, that, that kind of stuff. And um the members of the group, the women in particular, will uh you know see those kind of sinful foods in relation to danger, temptation. They'll talk about how sin tricks them how it traps them how it you know um uh, uh hides in unsuspecting places so that you know things that they thought were safe to eat all of a sudden aren't also sin that they that they say in their in their interviews mm. with me you know throws them off the wagon um you know mm. so this is all, all this kind of recycling of those normative kind of dominant meanings of sin related yeah. to the fall to a certain extent related to danger related to kind of deception and temptation and that those things need to be understood and overcome so you know there is a really kind of simplistic recycling in in that kind of way but what's really fascinating about this particular organization is that that's not really the official meaning that the organization gives to sin because if you go on the website or if you look at the reading material sin is something to embrace because uh you know the organization makes clear that we should kind of spend our sin you know wisely you get about five to 15 sins a day that you can kind of use every food as a sin value therefore you just have to calibrate your own kind of right, yeah. eating each day so that you you know you fall within those guidelines and sin is something that we should embrace and do so that's very different to how it's kind of talked about within christianity because you shouldn't really be doing that <laughs> <laughs> so you know on, on the one hand you know the official discourse that's kind of um, circulated in uh, in the organization is that sin is a good thing that sin is something that stops you from feeling guilty because you can have these foods and you should enjoy them um but what's therefore fascinating is that despite that positive kind of overlay if you like the women still um and the leader of the group actually herself they still repeat these normative christian ideas about sin being dangerous and bad and something to do with naughtiness and judgment and you know yeah, right. fall and that works well for the organization you know because they can they can recycle those those th those normative meanings and and put them to good use because it means that women never feel happy <laughs> mm. and they keep and they keep coming back week after yeah. week <laughs> Oh, that's so fascinating. Um, it's, so it's interesting you talked a bit about, like, you know, like, yeah, the, the, how pervasive this kind of generic normative um, understanding of, of, of the Christian doctrine of sin is. Um, and so I had, a, I had a lecturer when I was um, uh, it's in a theological education who, you know, kind of would talk about the way that often, you know, whatever, liberal, progressive, whatever word, Christians um, would often flee from, like, the doctrines of, sin and salvation because you're like oh that's you know, so messy and it's been so misused and that and he said the problem is though you just leave it to the people who will use it and use it yeah, for exactly. a number of nefarious ends um, yeah, yeah. so i guess you know having you know seen this and doing this ethnographic research and then and then writing the book and developing another way of thinking about this like you know i guess what what lesson what thinking might be thinking that, that you know the importance of these doctrines right not to just leave them yeah. for others because yeah. they will be used right it's so yes. pervasive yeah. and has such a yeah. stronghold so what's yeah. what's actually the most you know seems like to me from reading the book the most constructive thing we could do is well think about how we talk about them in a totally yeah. different way that's actually like a liberative and and life-giving yeah yeah absolutely um and that's that's that, that's that's the point you know it, the most dangerous thing that we can do is just leave them out there because they within the kind of neoliberal 
kind of culture within the West, they are used and market, marketized as well. So that, you know, they become really profitable um, kind of instruments that can be used to, to generate, you know, to, to, feed in, to feed into the capitalist monster, really. And that always is at the expense of particular individuals. And in this case, you know, often women's bodies. So, you know, and if we care about that kind of thing as, as Christian theologians, and we can't just leave these kind of doctrinal ideas out there, because as you say, they, they are being misused in many ways and put to bad use um, and dangerous use to, to cause harm. And, you know, we have, we have got to care to care about that. Um, yeah, and I, and I kind of think, you know, um, one of the, the reasons for the suspicion or almost like the phobia uh, within kind of liberal circles, if you like, of, of talking about sin in particular, actually, is also to do with the fact that, you know, it does have those overtones of negativity of, you know, individuals n failing being weak and obviously key to the liberal message and the neoliberal actually message is progress and this idea that human beings can do whatever they want to do within a neoliberal kind of worldview then that is absolutely crucial we've got to believe that we can remake ourselves and become who we want to be the sky's the limit and all of that business and the doctrine of sin says no it's not <laughs> so you know I understand that there is that phobia but like 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 we say you know unless we do something with those theological tools they will be picked up within a neoliberal capitalist environment and put to use yeah. um, uh, and we need to be in control of how they're being used as much as possible i think mm. so you, you 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 develop in the book you talk about this idea of kind of salvation being performed um which i i i i, I was attracted to i like this a lot and so kind of performed um, in, in, in response. And so I guess I'd just like to, you know, talk a little about that. And, and I guess some of the ways that you kind of think about how, you know, salvation be performed in the everyday, um, yeah. you know, and, and not just this kind of big, <laughs> dramatic, or long delayed kind of um, conception. Yeah. 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 So in the book, um, you know, I talk about, uh, so what I'm trying to do in the second half of the book actually is to say, well, if this is what women have said about sin, and this is what, you know, my critical reflections from the group is about the way that salvation is kind of conjured up in the group, then how do we actually take those, those voices and those stories from women seriously and use them to illuminate something about the Christian ideas of sin and salvation and reconstruct them in ways that aren't going to just completely repeat those dangerous kind of ramifications and implications. And first of all, I look at sin and then I, then I look at salvation. And, um, you know, salvation, as you say um, in the book, I'm trying to say that salvation is, isn't just some kind of theological idea. And it's, it's also not something that we should just sit and wait for passively. It's not something that just happens after we die. Salvation is something that we, we do, you know, and I draw on kind of Judith Butler's kind of idea and how she talks about gender as something which materializes. It's not natural. It's something that we perform and practice and we become good at it. So it looks natural. And then we convince ourselves that it is and that we're born that way and all of that kind of thing. And I take that from her and kind of think, well, actually, salvation is a bit like that because we also embody salvation in that kind of way. We've got to practice it daily and return to it. We've got to get ourselves mm. into, if you like, good habits of embodying and doing and acting in ways which bring about justice and freedom mm. and liberation and in a world which is obsessed by weight and sizeism you know we've as christians i think we, we have got to take seriously the challenge of practicing and embodying patterns of behavior which resist that and, and resist those those dangerous kind of injustices if you like so you know part of the thing that i uh, develop in the book around salvation is this move towards what i call sensible eating and you know that's not the kind of sensible eating which materializes in the weight loss group which is all about counting sin and being and trying to kind of use the will to kind of practice the body and train the body um, and discipline the body and stop it from kind of wanting what it wants and trying to detach the body and its emotions from food that's often how it shapes up in in the weight loss group and that's sensible 
uh, and an intelligent way to eat according to the leader and according to many women in the group. But what I say in, in, in the second half of the book is, no, we don't need that kind of approach to eating. What we need is a different kind of sensible eating and one which actually encourages us to be in touch with our food and to sense it, which is, you know, this is a sensible approach to eating. We've got to kind of, you know, take the time to, un to understand our food, where it comes from, take the time to savour it, to taste it, mm. you know, to, to experience it. And that that is about respect for food, but it's about respect for our bodies as well. And it's not about trying to overcome pleasure and kind of punish the body for wanting things and for feeling things about food and for having that attachment to food. You know, often within the aesthetic uh, tradition within Christianity, one of the things, you know, at the heart of the fasting tradition to a certain extent is this a desire to detach the body from its attachment to food and from pleasure because that drags the body down and you know drags the mind away from god and the spirit away from god so if and what i'm trying to say is well no you know christian practice is about attaching to food and actually really starting to feel it properly deep down in our guts you know so that we really do enjoy it so that we really do understand where it comes from um, and so that uh, we're very conscious about all of those things and intentionally uh, practicing that kind of approach to eating, um, which is very different, like I say, to the to the way in which eating often takes place within a kind of weight loss regimen. Um, and some of the theological kind of resources which feed into sensible eating for me are, you know, things to do with hello. <laughs> Things to do with Jesus's ministry of food and the way that his kind of um, um, the way that his ministry is all around food. You know, there's a reason for that, and that's because it's just you know it's it, 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 it's a it's it's a vehicle that Jesus uses to actually welcome those who are on the fringes of society and draw them in. You know, it's a way of practicing inclusion and of embodying a different way of living, and you know that's what he does. Um, and that's what we learn about to a certain extent in the New Testament. And that feeds into the kind of approach that I want us to take in terms of sensible eating. There are other kind of theological resources which inform it as well, which, you know, readers can learn about by... <laughs> by... Yeah, I think it'd be right to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Well, uh, one moment. Yeah, that's... That's so helpful. And I, I, I really love the way that that sensible eating and, and being, you know, I think I obviously would connect you to so much of the work we've, you mentioned earlier about um, being more aware of where our food comes from and the nature of the food that comes before us and is presented. Yeah. I, I guess as a final question, just, just as we kind of like land the plane here, um, you know, obviously you can only do so much. I mean, the book does a lot, but obviously there's only so much one can cover in this. But often when you're researching this, you're like, oh, if I had more time on that's this whole area of this culture this whole area of this food theology weight loss theology thing are there things that you really want to see others pick up um that you were like this is some stuff that i think really is, is, you know there's still so much work to be done in this area and, and here's some of the stuff i think is, is just right for the a good good theological engagement i think where the real work needs to be done now really is not well there's always kind of more books to write and there's always more academic scholarship to kind of you know publish um but you know i'm as you know a kind of practical theologian head on really mm, you mm. know what i'm actually concerned about is whether there's you know work that we can be doing in our churches and in our faith-based settings hands-on work where we yeah. can start kind of really talking about this and really mm. kind of engaging our faith and our values with yes. with um what we think about our own bodies and other people's bodies and how, how can we, you know, the sizes and rhetoric and the, the sizes, the sizes rhetoric and the sizes and kind of narrative, that's not going away. Mm. And, you know, we've seen even within kind of COVID, you know, the way in which certainly in the UK, the way in which, you know, size is being rolled in almost automatically and very, very quickly as being, well, if you're fat, then obviously you're going to kind of be at risk of death. And here's another reason why you need to kind of lose the pounds. And it didn't take very long for that to emerge. And there's a reason for that. And it's because, you know, it's just so kind of knitted into our kind of way of thinking that we just think it's so, you know, sensible and logical for that discourse to kind of be peddled. 
So I think actually, you know, the real work is about on the ground stuff, mm. grassroots level, trying to kind of engage faith with some of these narratives, which we're meeting in everyday, in our everyday kind of context on the news, through what we're reading. Mm. Yes. And, you know, they are, they are t- having real effects on, on our bodies. So let's start, mm. let's start trying to, you know, discuss that and see if we can resist some yes. of those harmful implications. Mm. Well, I do hope listeners take up that challenge uh, in, in, in their context. And I do hope listeners also pick up this book and read it. It is a wonderful read. And uh, uh, we've only touched, you know, scraped the surface here in this conversation. So you're really going to want to pick it up. So the book is Feminist Theology and Contemporary Diet and Culture, Sin, Salvation and Women's Late Weight Loss Narratives, written by Hannah Bacon out through TNT Clark. And I thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, I really enjoyed this conversation as much as I read the, uh, as much as enjoyed reading the book. And I hope that, Uh, we can have you on again sometime. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Liam. Great. Thanks, everybody. No worries. See you all next week, folks.